So, now we have come to battery circuit, we will see what a battery circuit is. We have just seen an alternator, we have seen a battery in the circuit. Now, we will see how a battery circuit operates. In the figure, you can see this is a figure of a battery circuit of a small aircraft, single piston engine aircraft, where you have a single electrical system. The aircraft battery and battery circuit is used to supply power for engine starting and to provide a secondary power supply in the event of an alternator or generator failure. So, we all know that the battery is used to start an engine and it also provides a secondary power supply in case your alternator or generator fails. In this diagram, you will see there are certain board lines, they are used to indicate heavy wires in the circuit. Batteries can supply large current flows. So, it is connected in the circuit through a solenoid. So, battery is connected through a solenoid in an electrical system in this circuit. At the start or end of each flight, the battery is connected or disconnected from the electrical distribution bus through the solenoid contacts. Now, coming to this diagram, you can see this is your battery, this is your master solenoid or we can call it a battery solenoid, this is your starter solenoid, this is your main bus. This is your master switch, this is your starter switch, this is the starter and this is the alternator. Here you can see there is an external power receptacle, here you have an external power receptacle and this is your external power solenoid. So, in order to start an aircraft, you can use a battery or you can use an external power, so that you, you can save your internal battery. So, this battery is connected to the system, to the total system through a solenoid, a master, so we call it a master solenoid or a battery solenoid. A battery master switch in the cockpit is used to control the solenoid. So, this master switch, this battery master switch is used to control this solenoid and this master switch is there in your cockpit on the instrument panel. Here it can be seen that the battery positive wire is connected to the electrical bus when the battery master switch is active. So, this battery positive wire, you can see this is the battery positive wire, negative is grounded, battery positive wire is connected to the bus through the master switch. So, when you activate this master switch, this battery gets connected to the main bus. The emitter shown in the battery circuit is used to monitor the current flow from the battery to the distribution bus. So, this emitter, this is emitter is also connected in the circuit and this emitter is used to monitor the current flow from the battery to the bus or from the bus to the battery. When all systems are operating properly, battery current should flow from the main bus to the battery. Now, in case when your system is operating properly, is normal operation is there, then your battery current should flow from the main bus. From the main bus, this current should flow to the battery, giving a positive indication on the emitter. So, current flowing from the bus to battery, you will get a positive indication on the emitter. This shows that your battery is being charged. If the alternator or generator experiences a malfunction. In case if there is any malfunction in the alternator or generator, your emitter will indicate a negative value. Emitter indicating a negative value means that 
the power is being extracted from the battery and the battery is soon going to get depleted. A negative indication means current is leaving the battery to power any electrical load connected to the bus. The battery is being discharged and the aircraft is in danger of losing all electrical power. In this battery circuit, this is your master switch, this is your master switch, this is your master solenoid and this is the battery. Battery negative is connected to ground, positive is connected to the solenoid, to the master solenoid and the negative end of the solenoid is connected to the battery. Now, when you put the master switch on in the cockpit, the circuit gets completed, this switch is on now, this circuit gets depleted, it gets connected, the solenoid gets active. Now, these, con these points will contact each other, the circuit gets completed, now the solenoid is active with the switch on, power here, the solenoid gets active, the power goes from this solenoid, from the master solenoid to the starter solenoid. Now, power is here at the starter solenoid. When you put the starter switch on, when you put the starter switch on, the starter solenoid also gets active and the current flows from the starter solenoid to the starter. This is your main bus. From the starter solenoid, you can see there is a connection to the main bus. From this solenoid, there is a connection to the main bus and an emitter is also connected, which indicates whether your power is going from the battery or it is coming from the alternator to the battery. So, when you switch on this master switch, the power, this solenoid gets activated. When this solenoid gets activated, power is there at the main bus. From this, due to this solenoid getting activated, the power is now available at the main bus. And when you engage the starter switch, this is starter solenoid gets activated and power reaches your starter. Next is the alternator circuit. In this diagram, you can see it is almost the same as the last diagram. This is the battery, again negative terminal to ground this end positive terminal connected to the master solenoid or the battery solenoid. Then you have the starter solenoid, the emitter connected, then you have a starter switch here. This is your master switch, master switch has got two parts, one is the battery and another is the alternator. This is your starter, this is your alternator, voltage regulator, then you have the main bus and one avionics bus. Alternator circuits must control power both to and from the alternator. So, the basic purpose of this circuit is to control power from the alternator and to the alternator. The alternator is controlled by the pilot through the alternator master switch. This is your alternator master switch. The power to the alternator is controlled by this alternator master switch. The alternator master switch in turn operates a circuit within the alternator control unit or voltage regulator. Now, this alternator master switch will operate a circuit within the alternator control circuit or a voltage regulator and sends current to the alternator field. So, 
via this voltage regulator the current is sent to the alternator field and this is being controlled by the alternator master switch. The alternator master switch will operate a circuit within the voltage regulator and sends current to the alternator field. If the alternator is powered by the aircraft engine, the alternator produces electrical power for the aircraft electrical loads. Now, when the alternator is powered by the engine, alternator starts producing electrical power for the different aircraft electrical loads. The alternator control circuit contains three major components of the alternator circuit, alternator, voltage regulator and the alternator master switch. So, in this alternator control circuit there are three major components, one is the alternator, second is voltage regulator and the alternator master switch. The voltage regulator controls the generator field current according to aircraft electrical load. So, this voltage regulator will control the generator field current according to the aircraft electrical load. If the aircraft engine is running and the alternator master switch is on, the voltage regulator adjusts current to the alternator field as needed. So, when the engine is running, your alternator master switch on, voltage regulator will adjust the current to the alternator field as needed. If more current flows to the alternator field, the alternator output increases and feeds the aircraft loads through the distribution bus. And all alternators must be monitored for correct output. Most light aircrafts employ an emitter to monitor alternator output. So, coming to the diagram, you see here you have a battery, this is your master solenoid. Now, when you put this master switch on, battery switch on, your master solenoid gets activated. This circuit gets completed here, when the switch is on, this circuit gets completed, the solenoid gets energized, the master solenoid gets energized. In turn, it transfers power to the starter solenoid. At the same time, at the same time, the power reaches your main bus. Now, power is available at the main bus. When you put your starter switch on, when you starter switch on, because of this starter switch, your this circuit gets completed with power already at the main bus and starter switch engaged. Your starter solenoid gets active, it gets energized and the power reaches from the starter solenoid to the starter. Now, with the starter on, your engine starts cranking and the engine gets started. Now, once the engine is running, you switch on the alternator, your alternator switch gets on. With the alternator switch on, power from the main bus via the alternator switch goes to the voltage regulator. This voltage regulator will now supply power to the alternator field. With the power at the alternator field and engine running, the alternator starts generating electrical power and supplies the main bus. So, this is how a basic alternator circuit operates. Now, in this figure, you show a uh, emitter which is used to monitor the alternator output. An emitter is placed in the alternator circuit which shows that current flow is flowing in one direction. This flow is from the alternator to the bus. Now, you can see in this diagram, now the current is flowing from the alternator via the emitter to the bus. Since the alternator, now because the alternator has got diodes, the current cannot flow from the bus to the alternator. So, this was about the alternator circuit. So, we have seen how the battery circuit functions, how an alternator circuit functions. Now, when troubleshooting an alternator system, be sure to monitor the aircraft emitter. 
So, in order to troubleshoot an alternator system, ammeter is a very important gauge to be monitored, to be seen. If the alternator system is inoperative, the ammeter gives a zero indication. So, in case if your ammeter is showing zero, is indicating zero, that means your alternator system is inoperative. In this case, the battery is being discharged because the power for all electrical loads is being supplied from the battery. A voltmeter is also a valuable tool when troubleshooting an alternator system. So, another important tool for troubleshooting an alternator system is the voltmeter. The voltmeter should be installed in the electrical system while the engine is running and the alternator operating. A system operating normally produces a voltage within the specified limits approximately 14 volts or 28 volts depending on the electrical system. Consult the aircraft manual and verify the system voltage is correct. If the voltage is below specified values, the charging system should be inspected. Now, the starter circuit. So, we have just seen the battery circuit, the alternator circuit. Now, the starter circuit. All modern aircrafts employ an electric motor to start the aircraft engine. So, nowadays all modern aircrafts, even small aircrafts, they have a starter, an electrical motor to start the engine. Since starting an engine requires several horsepower, the starter motor can often draw 100 or more amperes. So, starter while starting can draw 100 or more amperes. For this reason, all starter motors are controlled through solenoids. So, because of this high amperage, starter motors are also controlled through solenoids. The starter circuit must be connected as close as practical to the battery, since large wire is needed to power the starter motor and weight savings can be achieved when the battery and the starter are installed close to each other in aircraft. So, the starter circuit must be as close to the battery, so that you can save on large wires. This with this you can save on the weight also. As shown in the starter circuit diagram, the start switch can be part of a multifunction switch that is also used to control the engine magnetos. So, in this diagram you can see this is your master solenoid or the battery solenoid. This is your battery here, negative to ground positive connected to your solenoid, master solenoid. This is your starter solenoid, this is your starter motor, this is your master switch, this is your starter switch. In this starter switch, you can see this is your start position, start engage, this is your left, right and both. So, these are for the magnetos, left means on the left magneto, right means on the right magneto, both means on the both magneto and this S is the start position. That means, with the key in this engaged in this S position, your starter is engaged. So, this start switch is a basically a multifunction switch, which also controls the magnetos. The starter can be powered by either the aircraft battery or the external power supply. Again, your starter you can start give power to the starter solenoid either by the battery or by an external power. This is your external power plug and this is your external power solenoid. So, this either you can supply starting power by this solenoid via this solenoid from an external power to the starter solenoid or you can supply power from the battery to the starter solenoid. So, in the bottom figure you can see this is your starter switch, this is a multifunction switch, this is off, this is right, left both and start. So, this is your keyhole. When your key is engaged, 
to the start position that means your starter switch is engaged and once your engine starts the key gets engaged to the both position both means your both magnetos are working during most typical operations the starter is powered by the aircraft battery so in most of the aircraft operation your starter is getting power from the aircraft battery the battery master must be on and the master solenoid closed in order to start the engine with the battery so this in this diagram you can see this is a very basic diagram it will give you some basic idea how things are operating this is a battery this is your negative terminal to ground the positive is connected to the master solenoid now this master switch when is engaged your solenoid gets energized so with the master switch engaged solenoid master solenoid gets engaged power from the master solenoid goes to the bus the main bus from the bus the power is at the starter switch so once you engage the starter switch the starter solenoid gets energized and once the starter solenoid en gets engaged is energized power from the starter solenoid goes to the starter so this is how the starter circuit is operating power from the battery coming to the master solenoid master switch engaged master solenoid gets powered from the master solenoid power goes to the distribution bus main bus with the st starter switch on the starter solenoid gets engaged gets activated and power from the starter solenoid goes to the starter so this was all about your starter circuit now another is circuit we have is the avionics power circuit many aircrafts contain a separate power distribution bus specifically for electronics equipment so nowadays in the aircrafts whether light aircrafts whether complex aircrafts we have lot of avionics lot of electronics equipment in the aircraft which are very sensitive so in order to separate these electronics equipment from rest of the electrical equipment in the aircraft a separate distribution bus is provided for the electronics equipment this bus is often called as an avionics bus so here in this diagram this is your avionics bus this is your main bus this is your main distribution bus and in addition to the main bus you also have an avionics bus since modern avionics equipment employs sensitive electronic circuits it is often advantageous to disconnect all avionics from electrical power to protect their circuits so as i told that since the these electronics equipment are very sensitive so it is quite advantages to disconnect all these avionics equipment from electrical power to protect their circuits for example the avionics bus is often depowered when the starter motor is activated so when the starter motor is activated your avionics bus is depowered this helps to prevent any transient voltage spikes produced by the starter from entering the sensitive avionics this circuit you can see in the figure this circuit employs a normally closed solenoid so this is a solenoid this is the avionics solenoid we also call it an avionics contactor which is normally closed this will connect the avionics bus to the main bus so in between the avionics bus and the main bus is the avionics solenoid or the avionics contactor this avionics contactor connects the avionics bus to the main bus and this avionics contactor is normally closed solenoid the electromagnet of the solenoid is activated whenever the starter is engaged now in this figure you can see this is your avionics master switch this is your starter switch so 
Now you have the power at the main bus. You put the avionics master switch on. With the avionics master switch on, now your power is available at the avionics solenoid at this point. So once this starter switch is also engaged, when you engage the starter switch, with the starter switch engaged, your avionics solenoid gets energized. Once this gets energized, this these contacts will open. Once these contacts open, so power is interrupted to the avionics bus and in this way during starting you protect the electronics equipment, the avionics equipment from the main power bus. So, current is sent from the starter switch through diode D 1. You can see from the starter switch through diode D 1 current is sent causing the solenoid to open and depower the avionics bus. So, when you engage this starter switch from this starter switch via this diode D 1 the current it goes to the solenoid, the solenoid gets energized and these contacts open. Since this solenoid is normally closed and once the solenoid gets energized the contacts open and once the contacts are open this will depower the avionics bus. At this time when all when this solenoid is de-energized all electronics connected to the avionics bus will lose power. The avionics contactor is also activated whenever external power is connected to the aircraft. So, again this is your external power receptacle, this is your external power solenoid. You can connect the external power also and once the external power is connected this will de-energize your avionics bus. In this case, current travels through diodes D 2 and D 3 to the avionics bus contactor. So, in case if you are using an external power, so current will travel via diode D 3 and diode D 2 to the avionics solenoid. A separate avionics power switch may also be used to disconnect the entire avionics bus. So, you can also use this avionics power switch or a master switch to disconnect all the power fr from the avionics bus. In this figure you can see avionics power switch is wired in series with the avionics power bus. You can see this is connected in series with the avionics bus. This is the avionics master switch. In some cases the switch is combined with a circuit breaker and performs two functions called a circuit breaker function. In some of the diagrams, in some of the systems, electrical systems, this avionics master switch is combined with the circuit breaker and performs two functions that of a circuit breaker and a switch and so called a circuit breaker switch. Avionics contactor is often referred to as a split bus relay. This avionics contactor or an avionics solenoid is also called a split bus relay since the contactor separates, splits in this because the contactors separate, they split the avionics bus from the main bus. So, that is that is why this is also called a split bus relay. Now, coming to another circuit, a very important circuit in an aircraft, a landing gear circuit. In those aircrafts, who have a retractable landing gear system. So, this circuit is very important. So, in on light aircrafts who operate retractable landing gear systems, this circuit is very important for them. These airplanes employ a hydraulic system to move the gear. After takeoff, the pilot moves the gear position switch to the retract position starting an electric motor. So, in aircrafts employing a retractable landing gear system, after takeoff, 
pilot will select the landing gear selection lever to retract position. Once the lever is selected to retract position, your electric motor will start. The motor operates a hydraulic pump and the hydraulic system moves the landing gear. The electrical system must detect the position of each gear, right, left or nose. So, your landing gears, there are three gears. One is the nose wheel, nose gear, another is the left gear and the right gear. And this electrical system must determine when each, each gear reaches pull up or down, then the motor is controlled accordingly. So, the motor is controlled by the position of each gear. So, it is very important to detect the correct position of the gear. Accordingly, your motor will be operated. There are safety systems to help prevent accidental actuation of the gear. So, in this circuit, landing gear circuit, there are a series of limit switches to monitor the position of each gear during the operation of the system. These switches also called as limit switches, they are simple spring loaded switch with a momentary contact and are activated when a gear reaches its limit of travel. Generally, there are six limit switches located in the landing gear wheel wells. Three up limit switches are used to detect when the gear reaches the full retract position, up position. Three down limit switches are used to detect when the gear reaches the full extended or down position. So, there are six limit switches, three detecting your up limit position, that is the full retract position and three down limit switches, which detect your full down position. Each of these switches is mechanically activated by a component of the landing gear assembly when the appropriate gear reaches a given limit. The landing gear system must also provide an indication to the pilot that the gear is in a safe position for landing. So, in the cockpit, a pilot also needs to understand whether the gear is in a safe position for landing or whether the gear is in, a, in an unsafe condition. Many aircrafts employ a series of three green lights when all three gears are down and locked in the landing position. So, here in the diagram, you can see there are three green lights. One is for the nose gear, left gear, right gear. These three green lights indicate that the landing gear is down and locked. These three lights are activated by the up and the down limit switches found in the gear wheel well. So, this is your gear selection lever. When the pilot selects the lever in the up condition, your hydraulic motor operates and in order to bring the landing gears down, the pilot has to select this selection lever to the down condition. The hydraulic motor pump assembly is powered either through the up or down solenoids. So, this hydraulic motor or a pump assembly is powered through the solenoids. There are two solenoids, one is the up solenoid, another is the down solenoid. So, the power to the motor is through the two solenoids, up solenoid or the down solenoid. The solenoids are controlled by the gear selector switch and the six landing gear limit switches. Now, the solenoids, these solenoids are connect are controlled by the landing gear selection lever and the limit switches. Six limit switches, three up limit switches, three down limit switches. The three gear down indicators are individual green lights controlled by three gear down switches. So, the down indicators are the three green lights in the cockpit and these green lights are controlled by the gear down switches. As each gear reaches its down position, the limit switches moves to the down position and the light is illuminated. So, when the gear reaches the down position, the limit switch will move to the down position and the light is illuminated. This figure 
shows the landing gear in full down position. While reading the circuit diagrams, uh, it is always better to know the position of your landing gear. It helps you in analyzing the diagram and understanding current correct operation of the circuit. In this circuit diagram, and an important concept is that more than one circuit is used to operate the landing gear. So, there are more than one circuits which are being used to operate the landing gear. There is a low current control circuit fused at 5 amperes C B 2. In the figure, you can see this is a 5 ampere C B. This is the control circuit. This circuit is used to for indicator lights and the control of the gear motor contactors. So, these are the indicator lights. This is this is your main bus. On the main bus, there are two circuit breakers. One is the 5 ampere circuit breaker, another is the 30 ampere circuit breaker. This 5 ampere circuit breaker is going via terminal 1 to the limit switches. You can see there are 6 limit switches, 3 down limit switches and 3 up limit switches. They are further connected to the indicator lamps, the down, down lamps. Then this is your gear selector switch, this is your squat switch. You have two solenoids, one is the up solenoid, another is the down solenoid. Then you have this is the hydraulic pump motor. So, in this circuit diagram, you can see you have main bus, two CBs, one is the control current CB, which is supplying power to the limit switches and controlling the solenoids. You have the gear selector switch, then this is your gear horn, this gives you this is the warning horn, this gives you the gear unsafe light, warning light, this is your throttle switch. This is your squat switch. We will be reading about these switches. So, this circuit diagram current from the 5 ampere C B is supplied to the indicator lights and also controls the gear motor contactors or the solenoids. There is a separate circuit to power the gear motor, which is fused at 30 amperes. So, this is the circuit breaker 30 amperes circuit breaker, which is powering the gear motor through the solenoids. Since this circuit carries a large current flow, the wires should be as short as practical and carefully protected with rubber boots or nylon insulators. So, the current flow in this line is quite high. So, these the length of these wires should be kept as short as possible and should be carefully protected with rubber boots or nylon insulators. In this figure, you can see the current flow when the gear is traveling to the down position, when the gear is being extended. The this diagram shows the current flow. The diagram has been highlighted red to indicate the current flow of the gear traveling in the down position. So, to run the gear down motor, current must flow in the control circuit leaving C B 2. So, when the gear has to move in the down position, the current is supposed to flow from the main bus through this 5 ampere C B through this line, you can see the red line, then from this line to the limit switch, to the down limit switch. You can see the current flowing via terminal 1 to this down limit switch, then to another down limit switch and to the third down limit switch. You can see the current flowing here. To run the gear down motor, current must flow in the control circuit leaving C B 2 through terminal 1 to the not down contacts of the down limit switches. 
So, this is the not down contact of the down limit switch. The current is flowing to the not down contact of the down limit switch through terminal 1. The current from the CB through terminal 1 has come to the down limit switch to the not down position on all the three down limit switches you can see on the, there are three down limit switches this one, the second one and the third one. This current is flowing to the not down position. From here the current from the three down limit switches not down position the current has come to the terminal 3. You can see the three lines the current has come to terminal 3. From the terminal 3 the current flows to the down solenoid positive terminal. You can see here from here the current has flown to the positive terminal of the down solenoid. The negative side of the down solenoid coil is connected to the ground through the gear selector switch. This is the negative side of the down solenoid, this is your down solenoid. The negative side of the down solenoid is connected to the ground through the gear selector switch. These gear down switches they are wired in parallel and activated when the gear reaches the full down position. So, these switches all the down switches they are wired in parallel and gets activated when the gear selector goes to the down position. All three gears must reach full down to shut off the down motor. So, all three gears must, must reach in the down position, so that the motor is shut off. Also note that the gear selector switch, this is your gear selector switch. This gear selector switch controls the negative side of the gear solenoid. So, this is the negative side of the gear solenoid this is being controlled by the gear selector switch. The selector switch has independent control of the gear up or down motors through the control of the ground circuit to both the up and down solenoids. So, this selector switch has an independent control of the up and down motors through the control of the ground circuit to both the solenoids. Now, when the pilot is supposed to lower the gear, he will select the gear selection lever down. This is your gear selection lever, the pilot selects the lever to the down position. This circuit gets completed to the negative side of the solenoid, down solenoid. This circuit gets completed. Current from the main bus via the 5 ampere CB through the terminal 1 is coming to the down limit switches to the not down condition to the three down limit switches to the down limit sw switch at the no not down condition. This is the not down position for this left gear. This is the not down position for the nose gear and this is the not down position for the right gear. So, the current is flowing from the CB through terminal 1 to the down limit switch at the not down condition from all the three places the current from the down limit switch has come to terminal 3. See this current has come from this place, this current is coming at this point and this current is coming at this point. Now, the current from the three down limit switches via terminal 3 is going to the positive side of the down solenoid. So, the current has reached here. So, the circuit is completed with the gear selection lever in the down position. The down solenoid is now energized, down solenoid gets energized and the power, the current goes to the down side of the motor. As the motor is activated, the pump starts moving the sorry the landing gear starts moving down. So, once the landing gear moves down the down limit switch will contact the down points in the down limit switch from the not down condition to the down condition. All the three limit switches will come to the down condition and the current supply in the down limit switch from the down condition will be to the green lights to the three green lamps here the three green lamps will glow and 
the current to the down solenoid is interrupted due to which now there is no current here in the down solenoid and your motor is shut off. Further you can see that the selector switch this also has an independent control of the gear up and down motors through the control of the ground circuit to both the solenoids. So, if you put this lever from down condition to off condition then also your supply your circuit is interrupted and this selection switch this has an independent control of the motors to the down solenoids or the up solenoids. When the landing gear control circuit is sending a positive voltage to the down solenoid, when the circuit is sending a positive voltage to the down solenoid and the gear selector switch is sending negative voltage, is sending negative voltage, the solenoid magnet is energized. So, as we just discussed, when the solenoid is getting a positive voltage here and a negative voltage here, the solenoid gets energized. When the down solenoid is energized, the high current gear motor circuit sends current from C B 1 through the down solenoid contact points to the gear down motor. So, when the down solenoid is energized, when the down solenoid is energized, the high current gear motor circuit this will send current from C B 1 through the down solenoid contact points to the gear down motor. So, once this solenoid gets energized, the high current flows from this line to the down solenoid contact points and finally, to the gear down motor. When the motor runs, the hydraulic pump produces pressure and the gear begins to move. When all the three gears reach the down position, now when all the three gears reach the down position, the down limits switch will come at the down position, all the three limit switches, the gear down switches move to the down position, the three green lights illuminate, these three green lights will illuminate and the gear motor turns off completing the gear down cycle. Now, when the switches limit switches come to the down position, the current flow to the solenoid is interrupted which shuts off your motor and your gear down cycle is completed. Now, this diagram you can see the landing gear electrical diagram with the current flow path shown in red as the gear moves to the up position or the retract position. Now, in this diagram the current flow is in the up condition, up position. Again current must flow through C B 2 in the control circuit here the current must flow in the control circuit through C B 2 to each of the three gear up switches. Now, see the current is flowing through the C B 2 via terminal 1 to the gear up switch. You can see here the current is flowing to the gear up switch. In the gear up switch it is the not up condition. In all the three gear up limit switches you can see the not up condition. The current is flowing from the up limit switch in the up limit switch to the not up condition from the not up condition it has come to terminal 2 from all three switches to terminal 2. Starting in the top right corner of the diagram current must flow through C B 2 in the control circuit through terminal 1 through terminal 1 to each of the three gear up switches. With the gear up switches in the not up position you can see the three gear up switches they are in the not up condition not up not up and not up condition. Current flows to terminal 2 from the limit switch not up condition current is flowing to terminal 2 and finally, through the squat switch and finally, through this squat switch to the up solenoid electromagnet coil. From terminal 2 via the squat switch the current has flown to the up solenoid. This up solenoid this is the up solenoid this up solenoid coil receives negative voltage, this will receive negative voltage through the gear selector switch. Through the gear selector switch this up solenoid is getting the negative voltage. When the up solenoid coil 
is activated, the up solenoid closes and power travels through the motor circuit. So, when this selector switch, gear selector switch is selected in the up condition, up position, this completes the circuit, the solenoid, this negative voltage is coming here. The positive voltage is coming from terminal 2 via the squared switch to the solenoid. The solenoid gets energized, the up solenoid gets energized. When the up solenoid gets energized, the current flows to the hydraulic motor. To power the motor, current leaves the bus through CB1. In order to power the motor, current leaves through CB1, through the CB1 to the terminal at the down solenoid. From this CB1, the current is flowing to the terminal at the down solenoid onwards through the up solenoid. From the down solenoid, it has gone to the up solenoid to the up side of the motor. Remember, current cannot travel down through the solenoid in the down solenoid since the down solenoid is not activated. So, although the current is coming to the down solenoid, but it cannot flow further because this down solenoid is not activated. So, from here the current will flow to the up solenoid. With the solenoid energized, the current then flows to the up side of the motor. As the up motor runs, each gear travels to the retract position. Now, your motor has started running, your up side of the motor has started running, your gears have started traveling to the up position, to the retract position. As this occurs, the gear up switches move from the not up position to the up position. Now, when your gear reaches to the up condition, your limit switches will move from the not up condition to the up condition. All the three up limit switches will move from not up condition to the up condition. When the last gear reaches up, the current no longer travels to terminal 2 and the gear motor turns off. Now, when all the three limit switches move to the up condition, from the not up condition to the up condition, the current flow to terminal 2 is interrupted and the current is no longer available at the up solenoid. The up solenoid gets de-energized and your hydraulic motor shuts off. It should be noted that similar to down, the gear switches are wired in parallel. Similarly, as the down limit switches, the up limit switches are also wired parallel which means the gear motor continues to run until all the three gears reach the required position. So, until all the three gears are not in the up position, your hydraulic motor will continue to run and once the three gears are in the up position, the up limit switches are in the up condition, the motor will shut off. During both the down and up cycles of the landing gear operation, current travels from the limit switches to terminal 2. So, we have seen that in both the cycles, whether it is the down cycle or the up cycle, the current has traveled to terminal 2. From terminal 2, there is a current path through the gear selector switch to the gear unsafe light. From the terminal 2, via the gear selector switch, this is the gear unsafe light, the current also flows to the unsafe light. If the gear selector disagrees with the current gear position, in case if the gear selector is not in line with the current gear position, the gear, for example, gear is down and pilot has selected it up, the unsafe light will illuminate. The gear unsafe light is shown here in the bottom of the diagram. You can see here, this is the gear unsafe light. The current from the terminal 2 via the gear selector switch is also coming to the gear unsafe light and in case if the gear selector switch disagrees with the current gear position, this unsafe light will illuminate. So, to sum up, case when the gear is in transit condition, your gear unsafe light will illuminate. Now, the squat switch, this is the squat switch. This switch is used to determine whether the aircraft is on ground or in flight. This switch is located on a landing gear strut. When the weight of the aircraft compresses the strut, the switch is activated and moved to the ground position. So, when the switch is activated, the, since the switch is located on the landing gear strut, when the aircraft is on ground, the switch gets compressed and moves to the ground position. When the switch is in ground position, the gear cannot be retracted. So, once the switch is in the ground position, you cannot retract the gear 
and a warning horn sounds if the pilot selects the gear up. So, once the switch is in the ground position, the landing gear cannot be retracted and in case if your selection lever is selected in the up condition, your warning horn will sound. The squat switch is also sometimes called as the weight on wheels switch. Another switch called a throttle switch, this is a throttle switch is used in conjunction with the landing gear circuits. There are micro switches in the throttle quadrant which are used to activate a warning horn and a red gear warning light under the warning conditions. So, these throttle switches they are there in the throttle quadrant and these switches they operate a warning horn, this is the horn and the red unsafe light under the following conditions. Now, the first condition may be that your gear is up, gear is in the up condition, is in the retracted condition and your power that is your throttle is reduced below approximately 14.14 inches of manifold pressure. That means, your gear is in the up condition and throttle is reduced. That may be the condition when you may have the red unsafe light and the warning horn. Gear selector switch up while on the ground and throttle in retarded position. Another condition may be that your gear selector switch is in the up condition while you are on ground while the aircraft is on ground and at the same time throttle is in the retarded position. So, this may be another condition where you may have warning horn and unsafe flight. Whenever the flaps are extended beyond the approach position and the landing gear is not down and locked. So, in case your landing gear is not down and locked and your flaps are extended beyond the approach position that is the 10 degrees position, then also you may have a condition where there may be a warning horn and then and a red unsafe light. The same horn will also sound when the aircraft is on the ground and the landing gear handle or the lever is moved to the up position. So, this was all about the landing gear circuit diagram. We have seen how the landing gear is extended, how the landing gear is retracted, we have seen the current flow, we have 6 limit switches, 3 up limit switches, 3 down limit switches, then we have some safety features called the sw squat switch, throttle switch, warning horn, unsafe lights. So, this was all about your landing gear circuit. Now, coming to the wiring part of the electrical system, wiring is a very important feature. So, we will just look at the different wiring diagrams, what are the different diagrams, just a brief idea about the different diagrams. So, electrical wiring diagrams are included in most aircraft service manuals and specify information such as the size of the wire, type of terminals to be used for a particular application. So, in the wiring diagrams you may be get the size of the wire the type of terminals for a particular application. All these wiring diagrams you can find in the aircraft service manuals, maintenance manuals. Furthermore, wiring diagrams identify each component within a system by its part number and its serial number including any changes that were made during the production run of an aircraft. These wiring diagrams they are often used for troubleshooting any snag in the electrical system. Then we may have some block diagrams, this is one sample of the block diagram. A block diagram is used as an aid for troubleshooting complex electrical and electronic systems. Block diagram consists of individual blocks, it consists of individual blocks that represent several components such as printed circuit boards or some other type of replaceable modules. Then another type of diagrams, pictorial diagrams where pictures of components are used instead of the conventional electrical symbols. This pictorial diagram helps the maintenance personnel to visualize the operation of a system. 
So, this is one sample of the pictorial diagram. Another type of diagram is the schematic diagrams. They are used to illustrate a principle of operation and therefore, does not show parts as they actually appear or function, but they indicate the location of components with respect to each other. So, schematic diagrams they indicate the location of components with respect to each other and are quite useful in troubleshooting. Now, coming to the wire types, there may be different types of wires. The satisfactory performance of any modern aircraft depends to a great extent on the continuing reliability of electrical systems and subsystems. Improperly or carelessly maintained wirings can be a source of both immediate and potential danger. A wire is described as a single solid conductor, it may be a single solid conductor or stranded conductor, this is stranded conductor covered with an insulating material. Due to in flight vibrations and flexing, conductor round wire should be stranded to minimize fatigue breakage. So, there may be a lot of vibration and flexing in flight. So, all the conductors round wires they should be stranded, so as to minimize fatigue breakage. The term cable as used in aircraft electrical installations includes two or more separately insulated conductors in the same jacket, two or more separately insulated conductors twisted together, one or more insulated conductors covered with a metallic braided shield, they may be called shielded cable, a single insulated center conductor with a metallic braided outer conductor, also called radio frequency cable. The most important consideration in the selection of aircraft wire is properly matching the wires construction in the to the application environment. Wire construction that is suitable for most severe environmental conditions to be encountered should be selected. Wires are categorized as being suitable for either open wiring or protected wiring application. The wire temperature rating is typically a measure of the insulation's ability to withstand the combination of ambient temperature and current related conductor temperature rise. Coming to conductors, the two most generally used conductors are copper and aluminum. Each has characteristics that makes it useful under certain circumstances. Each has certain disadvantages also. Copper has a higher conductivity, is more ductile has relatively high tensile strength and can be easily soldered. Whereas, copper is more expensive and heavier than aluminum. Although aluminum has only about 60 percent of the conductivity of copper, it is used extensively. Its lightness makes possible long spans and its relatively larger dia for a given conductivity reduces corona. Corona, it is the discharge of electricity from the wire when it has a high potential. The discharge is greater when small dia wire is used than when large dia wire is used. Some bus bars are made of aluminum instead of copper, where there is a greater radiating surface for the same conductance. Plating. Now, bare copper develops a surface oxide coating at a rate dependent on temperature. This oxide film is a poor conductor of electricity and inhibits determination of wire. Therefore, all aircraft wiring has a coating of tin, silver or nickel that has far slower oxidation rates. Tin coated copper is a very common plating material. It can be used up to the limiting temperature of 150 degrees centigrade. Now, silver coated wire is used where temperatures do not exceed 200 degrees centigrade and nickel coated wires retains its properties beyond 260 degree centigrade. Insulation, two fundamental properties of insulation materials are insulation resistance and dielectric strength. These are entirely different properties. Insulation resistance is the resistance to current leakage through and over the surface of insulation materials. Insulation resistance can be measured with a magometer or insulation tester 
without damaging the insulation. And the data so obtained gives a useful guide in finding that your insulation is in the correct condition or not. Dielectric strength is the ability of the insulator to withstand potential difference and is usually expressed in terms of the voltage at which the insulation fails because of the electrostatic stress. Maximum dielectric strength values can be measured by raising the voltage of a test sample until the insulation breaks down. The type of conductor insulation material varies with the type of installation. So, insulation materials for new aircraft designs are made of Teflon, polyamide or PTFE. Since electrical wire may be installed in areas where inspection is infrequent over extended periods of time, it is necessary to give special consideration to heat aging characteristics in the selection of wire. Resistance to heat is of primary importance in the selection of wire for aircraft use as it is the basic factor in wire rating. Where wire may be required to operate at higher temperatures due either to high ambient temperatures, high current loading or a combination of the two, selection should be made on the basis of satisfactory performance under the most severe operating conditions. Now, wire shielding with the increase in number of highly sensitive electronic devices found on modern aircraft, it has become very important to ensure proper shielding for many electric circuits. Shielding is the process of applying a metallic covering to wiring and equipment to eliminate electromagnetic interference. EMI is caused when electromagnetic fields induce high frequency voltages in a wire or component. The induced voltage can cause system inaccuracies or even failure. Wire size selection. Wire is manufactured in sizes according to a standard known as the American wire gauge or the AWG. The wire dias become smaller as the gauge numbers become larger. Typical wire sizes range from a number 40 to number 0000. Wire identification. The proper identification of electrical wires and cables with the circuits and voltages is necessary to provide safety of operation, safety to maintenance personnel and ease of maintenance. All wires used on aircraft must have its type identification imprinted along its length. It is a common practice to follow this part number with the five digit or letter commercial and government entity code identifying the wire manufacturer. You can identify the performance capabilities of existing installed wire. You need to replace and avoid the inadvertent use of a lower performance and unsuitable replacement wire. <coughs> Placement of identification markings on the wire. Identification markings should be placed at each end of the wire and at 15 inch maximum interval along the length of the wire. Wire less than 3 inches in length need not be identified. Wires 3 to 7 inches in length should be identified approximately at the center. Added identification marker sleeves should be located so that ties, clamps or supporting devices need not be removed to read the identification. The wire identification code must be printed to read horizontally from left to right or vertically from top to bottom. There are different types of wire markings. The preferred method is to mark directly on the wire without causing insulation degradation. Teflon coated wires, shielded wiring, multiconductor cable and thermocouple wires usually require special sleeves to carry identification marks. There are some special wire marking machines available that can be used to stamp directly on the type wires mentioned above. Whatever method of marking is used, the marking should be legible and the color should contrast with the wire insulation or sleeve. Several different methods can be used to mark directly on the wire like hot stamp marking, inkjet printers and laser jet printers, bonding and grounding. One of the more important factors in the design and maintenance of aircraft electrical system is proper bonding and grounding. Inadequate bonding or grounding can lead to unreliable operation of systems, EMI, electrostatic discharge, damage to sensitive electronics, personal shock hazard or damage 
from lightning strike. Grounding is the process of electrically connecting conductive objects to either a conductive structure or some other conductive return path for the purpose of safely completing either a normal or fault circuit. The design of the ground return circuit should be given as much attention as the other leads of a circuit. A requirement for proper ground connections is that they maintain an impedance that is essentially constant. Ground return circuits should have a current rating and voltage drop adequate for satisfactory operation of the connected electrical and electronics equipment. Equipment items should have an external ground connection even when internally grounded. Power ground connections for generators, transformer, rectifiers, batteries, external power receptacles and other heavy current loads must be attached to individual grounding brackets that are attached to aircraft structure with a proper metal to metal bonding attachment. This attachment and the surrounding structure must provide adequate conductivity to accommodate normal and fault currents of the system without creating excessive voltage drop or damage to the structure. Power return fault currents are normally the highest currents flowing in a structure. The use of common ground connections for more than one circuit or function should be avoided except where it can be shown that related malfunctions that could affect more than one circuit do not result in a hazardous condition. Bonding, it is the electrical connecting of two or more conducting objects not otherwise adequately connected. The following bonding requirements must be considered. Equipment bonding, low impedance paths to aircraft structure are normally required for electronic equipment to provide radio frequency return circuits and for most electrical equipment to facilitate reduction in EMI. The cases of components that produce electromagnetic energy should be grounded to structure. To ensure proper operation of electronic equipment, it is particularly important to confirm the system's installation specification when interconnections, bonding and grounding are being accomplished. Metallic surface bonding. All conducting objects on the exterior of the airframe must be electrically connected to the airframe through mechanical joints, <coughs> conductive hinges or bond straps capable of conducting static charges and lightning strikes. Exceptions may be necessary for some objects such as antenna elements whose function requires them to be electrically isolated from the airframe. Such items should be provided with an alternative means to conduct static charges and or lighting currents as appropriate. All isolated conducting parts inside and outside the aircraft having an area greater than 3 square inches and a linear dimension over 3 inches that are subjected to appreciable electrostatic charging due to precipitation, fluid or air in motion should have a mechanically secure electrical connection to the aircraft structure of sufficient conductivity to dissipate possible static charges. A resistance of less than 1 ohms when clean and dry generally ensures such dissipation on larger objects. Higher resistances are permissible in connecting smaller objects to airframe structure. Now coming to aircraft lighting systems, there are various lights in an aircraft, outside the aircraft, inside the aircraft, different types of lights. We will just have a brief idea of the different lights on an aircraft. Aircraft lighting systems provide illumination for both exterior and interior use. Lights on the exterior provide illumination for such operations as landing at night, inspection of icing conditions and safety from mid-air collision. Interior lighting provides illumination for instruments, cockpits, cabins and other sections occupied by crew members and passengers. Certain special lights such as indicator and warning lights indicate the operation status of equipment. <coughs> Coming to exterior lights, position, anti-collision, landing and taxi lights are common examples of aircraft exterior lights. So, we have 
position lights, anti collision lights, landing lights, taxi lights on outside an aircraft. Some lights are required for night operations. Some other types of exterior lights are wing inspection lights and these wing inspection lights are of great use for specialized flying operations. Position lights, aircraft operating at night must be equipped with position lights. We also call them as navigation lights. A set of position lights consists of one red, one green and one white light. The green light unit is always mounted at the extreme tip of the right wing. So, the green light is on the extreme tip of the right wing. The red unit is mounted in a similar position on the left wing. So, the green position light, green navigation light on the right wing tip, red navigation light or red position light on the left wing tip. The white unit is usually located on the vertical stabilizer in a position where it is clearly visible through a wide range from the rear of the aircraft. Position lights are also known as navigation lights. Anti collision lights. An anti collision light system may consist of one or more lights. They are rotating beam lights that are usually installed on top of the fuselage or tail in such a location that the light does not affect the vision of the crew member or detract from the visibility of the position lights. Large transport type aircraft use an anti collision light on the top and one on the bottom of the aircraft. <coughs> in the figure you can see this is the vertical stabilizer and on the vertical stabilizer you have this, this is the anti collision light. <coughs> so, in an aircraft you can see in this bottom figure the navigation light on the left side, left wing tip, red, red light, green light on the right wing tip and a white light on the top of the vertical stabilizer. Landing and taxi lights. Landing lights are installed in aircraft to illuminate runways during night landings. Landing lights of smaller aircraft are usually located midway in the leading edge of each wing or streamlined into the aircraft surface. Taxi lights are designed to provide illumination on the ground while taxiing or towing the aircraft to or from a runway, taxi strip or in the hangar area. Wing inspection lights. Some aircrafts are equipped with wing inspection lights to illuminate the leading edge of the wings to permit observation of icing and general conditions of these areas in flight. These lights permit visual detection of ice formation on wing leading edges while flying at night. Now, coming to interior lights, aircrafts are equipped with interior lights to illuminate the cabin. Commercial aircraft have a lighting system that illuminates the main cabin, an independent lighting system so that passengers can read when the cabin lights are off and an emergency lighting system on the floor of the aircraft to aid passengers of the aircraft during an emergency. Now, the maintenance and inspection of lighting systems, inspection of an aircraft's lighting system normally includes checking the condition and security of all visible wiring connections, terminals, fuses and switches. So, general inspection is to visually see the condition and security of the wiring which is visible, the connections which are visible, terminals, fuses and switches. Then a continuity light or meter can be used in making these checks, since the cause of many troubles can often be located by systematically testing each circuit for continuity. One is the visual check, another check is the continuity check, which you can do with the help of a meter, with the continuity meter and this check may be of use to identify the faults in the various wirings. So, this was all about the aircraft electrical system. Thank you.